The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Sunday, May 24th, 2015. Hello and welcome in to eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time, where you can interact with us with your questions and comments related to the Bible, and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And now with Sunday afternoon's questions and answers, here's Chris McCann. Okay, if anyone has a question or a comment um, that you'd like to make and you're here present, please come up to the microphone. Um, if you're listening on Pal Talk, if you're listening on Pal Talk or, or some other way, you can uh, enter your question or comment into the text and Bob will relay it to us. Yes, Landry. Hi, Chris. Um, just a couple comments. What I'm getting a lot out of this is uh, it seems that the patterns are, it's really becoming evident. The patterns in the Bible repeat themselves. And like every institution or person or situation that or you know God uses, then he transitions from that. And then the test is, are you going to trust me and my work? You know, national Israel, um, you know, the church age, um, even ministries that God used faithfully, uh, individuals. And then when the transition is made, you know, uh, like national Israel, God, you know, they would seem to be the representation of the kingdom of God. Then he transitioned from that, and then they still believe, well, you know, we're God's people, and how will God bring judgment on us? Um, he used the temple. Jesus <clears throat> taught in the temple, and then he transitioned from the temple age to the church age. And every transition, it seems that he would use a person or institution. Then when he transitions, the test is, are you going to trust me and my word? Um, and now the situation seems to be that, like, national Israel, they're still looking for the, the coming of the Messiah the first coming. Those that were, that don't believe in May 21st, that were even involved with May 21st, um, they're waiting for the second coming. And he's come already, as far as releasing the prisoners from Satan's prison house and, and shutting the door. Now it seems that um, the situation we have, what I find very interesting, for me, I believe May 21st, and there was a lot of evidence to May 21st. This seems to be even, there seems to be more evidence with uh, the possibility of October than May 21st because May 21st even adds to the information leading up to the possibility of October. But again, the main emphasis is the timeline, and that's the other big thing for me. The date is very encouraging, the possibility, but the most important thing is that the timeline is correct. Since May 21st, God has opened his word again to us and showed us that the timeline is correct. And yes, we had to make some adjustments, but everything is right on track. Now, it seems to be that this looks so positive and encouraging, but yet we're in a situation where we say it's just a possibility, that we have to sit back, be humble, because of the fact that we went through May 21st and it looks so positive. Now we realize, even when we see something so clearly, there could be more information. Now you have people that are saying, no, no, we have to be absolute. And it just seems to be very interesting that now even that's becoming a test. Are we going to trust God, be humble and wait upon him um, and let him, you know, in his time? And I just, you know, uh, just find that very interesting. Well, thank you uh, for sharing that. And, you know, it is, it is true that Israel still thinks they're the holy people. They, they still believe that the promises are to them and to their seed the physical descendants of Abraham. And I think it's one of the reasons why they, they um, entered back into the land after almost 2,000 years, because they had that mindset that the land is theirs, and they were scattered for centuries, and then God used their incorrect understanding of the land and the promise to them to help bring them back together as... Uh, a sign of the fig tree being in leaf. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I think we do have to be humble. We have to just lay out all the biblical evidence concerning October 7th in 2015 as the likely date for the end of the world. And I, I just don't see any purpose in, in trying to guarantee it or 
put an exclamation point on it in any kind of way. Uh, it, it doesn't serve any purpose. And uh, I think, you know, we're, we're sharing all the information we have and can share, and we'll let people check it out. But thank you for your comments. Yes. Um, before I ask my question, I want to make sure I have my spiritual picture straight. <laughs> okay. um, the 12 tribes of, 12 is fullness, right? So the 12 tribes right. of Israel is the t fullness of the believers. You mean in Revelation where it speaks of uh, 12 tribes um, in, well, I'm in thinking Revelation more like 7, the Old God Testament. says 12,000 from this tribe and the next tribe? Well, and... I'm thinking more of the 12 tribes of Israel after the 40 years passing over Jordan, which is a picture of hell and God's wrath into the land of Canaan, which is the picture of heaven. Is that correct? Yes, it, even though it's not that simple, because we have uh, the Israelites coming out of Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, which is a picture of heaven, and getting over to the other side, and then God tries them with the spies searching out the land for 40 days, and they fail, and then he judges them with a 40-year wandering period in which he says the carcasses of all those that murmured against him would fall in the land, and, and they did. And so the vast majority of them were unsaved, but they typified the elect. And especially at the time of the crossing, all of the unsaved, they perished in the wilderness. It, even though of that number of 20 and under, many of them are probably unsaved, yet they would more typify the elect. And then they cross over, and, and then the, the story's not over. Then they conquer through Joshua and, and the 12 tribes the land of Canaan, and there's battle after battle after battle. So it begins to develop another spiritual picture. Okay, I became a little confused. Um, in Numbers 32, 1 to 5, I don't know if you want to read it, and then I'll ask her. All right, Numbers 32, in verse 1, Now the children of Reuben... And the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that behold, the place was a place for cattle. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came. So you're, the two and a half tribes that stayed on that yeah, side. Yeah, so then it wasn't the fullness of them that went in. It was Well, less, re but so remember, does... they went to battle. They all crossed over. When the Levites stepped into Jordan and the waters parted, and they all, all Israel crossed over. Some of their wives and children stayed back. But the armies of Reuben and Gad and Manasseh crossed over. So all 12 tribes did cross over. And then a stone was selected and placed in Jordan representing each of the 12 tribes. And oh, okay. it was a head of the tribe that I think picked out the stone. They might have actually placed the stone in Jordan. So that all 12 tribes were represented. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Praise the Lord for another meeting. Uh, on behalf of uh, our dear friends, Joe Derringer in Wisconsin, these uh, Facebook friends, they are like-minded. Robin and uh, Michael mm. McCarthy, they're planning to come out here. And uh, Joe's question is, um, can we have a meeting like this, you know, uh, on October 4th, because the last one will be September 4th. Is that Sunday. a Sunday? For Sunday. Sunday. So we, we like back to back. Well, the problem is we, we can't meet here because we only rent this place once a month and it's rented out the other Sundays. So we, we couldn't meet here. Um, we'll have to see. I, I don't know. Well, maybe somebody can offer their place, you know. Trish was just saying that, you know, she has a big backyard. Maybe we can assemble there. Trish uh, is also on Facebook. Uh, she came yeah. here for the first time. Well, I, I, we'll have to think about it. We'll have to. Okay. Now, um, I, I don't have a question, but, you know, just a comment. Uh, one of your studies, I think you mentioned about the co-regency. And I remember... The Lord says, the Father always works, so does he, Jesus Christ. And then um, the co-regency, I just wondered, you know, some of the kings, I don't know if it's just happened to the uh, ten tribes of Israel and the Judah, so one tribe, right? Now, the, the line of David, the Judah one, um, the south, 
I think they have co-regency of father and son. And the youngest, I forget how old, and I don't remember the Israel side. Well, uh, occasionally, co- occasionally there would be a co-regency, co-regency of two kings reigning at the same time, like father and with son, right? David and Solomon. So they father had a and son. co-regency of four yeah. years. Yes. Now it just and so bro- David mm-hmm. reigned from um, 1007 to 967 BC, 40 years. And in 967, the foundation of the temple was laid. But in 971, Solomon began to reign, and he reigned 40 years to 931. So there was an overlapping of four years. Okay. And that happened occasionally, especially if a king was sick or elderly. Like David, remember the Bible indicates he, he, uh, he wasn't doing that well physically. He was ail- ailing and... So he wanted to make sure that Solomon would be the next king. And, and the Bible also tells us that Bathsheba came to David to remind him of his promise. And that's why he was made king while David was still alive. And I that happened occasionally with a couple of other kings. Other kings, yeah. And they were younger, I think. They were very young. One of them, um, um, I, I don't know. We have to look at But the, anyway, uh, it just dawned on me that Jesus was being worshipped. When he was in the, you know, when he, when he was very young, like people say, he was not a baby uh, when they came to see him. Yeah, the, he the was. Wise uh, men came to, uh, to worship, house. and they say, where was where was he, the king of the Jews? Uh, and um, so it just led me to that idea that he, parabolically, he was like co-regent with a father, you know, he, and he was worshipped at two years old. I mean, if he was two years old, you know, or six years old, well, I, it's I don't like a co-regency. Know if we want to use that kind of term uh-huh. because he is one with the father. Yes, and but a, parabolically. And co-regency is two kings, even though right. God is three persons. But I, I don't think, but if para- the Bible doesn't that's, say that's that, why I we, say parabolically. we'd be better it's off like, not And the father works, that. he always works, like he's co-laborer with the father, you know, so co-region with the father, but it's just a thought. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, the question from Pal Talk is, if I attend a fellowship that teaches that we are still in the day of salvation and then attend a fellowship that teaches that we are in the day of judgment where there is no salvation, can this be serving two masters at one time? As you described the fly being in the ointment, as to pursuing a false doctrine, Matthew six twenty four. Well, you know, no matter what we attend or listen to, um, if it's a fellowship, we we want to make sure we're where truth is found, and that's really the question: uh, Should we be listening to two different things? Um, some people are confused. Some people, for a time, didn't know what God had done and what the situation was. So they might go back and forth. They might listen to two things. It it reminds me of before Judgment Day, May 21 came, and the Bible was teaching the church age is over, get out of your church. And then you'd have some people, I'm sure, and some people came here too, that would listen to Mr. Camping on the radio and then go to their church. And they would talk to the pastor at the church. What do you think? And so they were, they were hearing conflicting things. And the, the thing to do is to follow truth, to follow um, what the Bible says. And, uh, of course, the Bible tells us that salvation has come to a close, that, that uh, God is no longer saving. And so if we are going to go to a fellowship, which we don't have to do, but if someone wants to go to a fellowship, they should pick the one where truth is being taught. It is an important subject. It's an important point because it it impacts a lot of different things. Um, how you pray, um, the the whole point of the message of sharing from the Bible is different. If God has ended salvation, why are we sharing from the Bible? To feed sheep, to offer spiritual nourishment to those that are already saved. But if, if someone thinks God is still saving, why are they sharing from the Bible? They might have that in mind, 
but also they they would want someone to hear and become saved and that idea um, is um, very much spoken against at this time by God in his word and uh, we're we're not to try and sow seed or evangelize in any kind of a way so um, yeah I would say that it's it's not a good thing to uh, go back and forth between this and that. At some point, you know, when people fluctuate like that, when it was the end of the church age, they're they're kind of doing what um, what some of the Jews did in Acts 28, when Paul told them after he was shipwrecked and and he had his own hired house in Rome, and the Jews came to him, and they would listen to Paul. But then they had discussion amongst themselves. And it says in Acts 28, um, in verse 23, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, And some believe not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. So they had disagreement amongst themselves. They're listening to each other. And, well, isn't that a good thing? Don't we want to get feedback? We want God's word. When when God says, check out a thing to see if it's so, or search the scriptures to see if it's so, it, it it's not the idea, well, let me go to my pastor and see what my pastor says, and then let me go to the elder and see what the elder says, and then I listen to Mr. Camping, see what Mr. Camping says, are you checking the scriptures? Are you checking men? Are you checking the, the minds of men? And what theologians say? And what commentators say? No. You go to the Bible itself. And, and that's what uh, people need to do regarding salvation. And uh, unfortunately, some are checking what Family Radio is teaching against what E-Bible is teaching compared to what BMI is teaching and and so forth, and that that is not the way to do it. We go directly to the Word of God, and uh, we allow the Bible to guide us and direct us. Thank you for your question. Uh, yes, um, I want to know if you I want to know if you can tell me about uh, what's between uh, supernatural and miracles. What's what? between supernatural and miracles? Yes. Well, um, something supernatural, you know, we have our natural occurrences, right? Uh, Yes, yes. Like, for instance, if you go to the ocean or a lake or a river and you go out into the water, what's going to happen? You're going to go into the water. Why? And, And it's the same for me. It's the same for any person. We sink into the water. And if you're like me and you can't swim, <laughs> well, you better hope someone's there to help you. <laughs> but we go into the water, but what did Jesus do? When the um, disciples were on a ship yeah. and there was a storm, yeah. he came to them at their time of need, walking on the water, yes. which cannot happen naturally because there, there's laws of physics and, and so forth that won't allow anybody to walk on the water. So Christ walked on the water, that's a miracle, and it's a supernatural event or occurrence yes. because the natural thing is to sink. Yes. And not only that, you know, sometimes uh, in the Muslim group, the Bible Answers Muslims Questions group, they like to say Jesus is just the prophet. He's like all the other prophets. And then you point out to them, well, did Jeremiah or Isaiah ever walk on water? Or, or did, uh, you know, you can list the whole 
slew of things Jesus did, none of the other prophets ever did, and certainly never to the degree the, the mighty miracles that Christ did. And not only did Jesus walk on water, but he also commanded Peter. Now, now which prophet walked on water? And the answer is none. And what other prophet could tell a man to come out and walk on water just like himself? And, of course, he, he's not just a prophet but he is God himself who has all power and might. And so God can suspend the laws that govern this world in, in order to perform miracles, like when Jesus turned water into wine. You can't turn water into wine. But Christ turned water into wine, and, and so miracles are, uh, well, not always. The word miracle actually is translated as sign sometimes, but... But normally the word miracle has to do with a supernatural occurrence of God suspending a law, a natural law, in order to show people that he is God. Yes. And Christ would do that uh, often. Okay. Uh, so, 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 so if you can turn to Acts, I mean, not Acts, I mean, uh, Isaiah 57, verses 1 to 8, and uh, tell me what, what this has to be. Well, that, that's a lot of verses. Do you have a question about any particular verse? Verses 1 to 7, talking about... Uh, all, right, all right, I'll read it. Yeah. The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. But draw near hither, ye sons of the sorceress, the seed of the adulterer and the whore. Remember earlier with the Jews, you are of your father, the devil. They're the seed of Satan. And you, you, could, you could also relate it to this kind of language, the sons of the sorceress. Against whom do ye sport yourselves? Against whom make ye a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? Are ye not children of transgression, a seed of falsehood? Inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks, among the smooth stones of the stream is thy portion. They are thy lot. Even to them hast thou poured a drink offering. Thou hast offered a meat offering, should I receive comfort in these. Upon a lofty and high mountain hast thou set thy bed. Even thither wentest thou up to offer sacrifice. Uh. I was wondering if this has something to do with, with the idolatry or a judgment or to that nature, you know. Well, God is, uh, he's speaking to the unsaved, it looks like, the sons of the sorceress, and, and uh, he also called them children of transgression, um, a seed of falsehood, and that also would relate to Satan, who's the father of lies. Yeah. That, that the unsaved are spiritual descendants of Satan, like the true believers, are spiritual descendants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And last question. Uh, can I be like, I was going to talk about, uh, what about life after death? Do uh, um, you have a spiritual meaning of that? Well, there's, there's life after death for the elect, yeah. but there's no life after death for the unsaved because they're dead. And the Bible indicates that, that once somebody dies, that's it. They cease to be. And they are no more. They, they're, they're going to be annihilated and utterly destroyed. But thank you for your question. Yeah. I have, a, I have a couple questions or a few questions. Okay, so my first question is, is it true that uh, certain parts of the King James Version Bible has interesting, awkward, or strange language to it? I yes. Just, okay. <laughs> so with that in mind, and we should check out the, the interlinear Bible to see if it's the right translation or not from the original uh, Hebrew Greek, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, with that in mind now, um, say a person prior to May 21st, 2011, they were reading the King James Version Bible, they came across the verse that had interesting, awkward, or strange language to it, but yet they did not know it was the right translation from the original Hebrew and Greek, but they did know the original Hebrew and Greek was true, but they did understand that they heard the verse, the King James Version verse, even though they didn't know it was the right translation, but they heard it. Could God have saved that person still through that verse? You know what I'm saying? Oh, I think I know what you're saying. 
We know that God saves through his word. Yeah, but I'm saying... Comes, you, I, hold up. Okay. We know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But we also know there are some mistranslations in the King James Bible. So is it possible for someone to hear a mistranslation and for God to save that individual through that one verse, which is very unlikely to happen, that uh, God brings his word to someone who's one of his elect to save them and just brings one verse and that verse happens to be mistranslated. It's probably astronomical, you know, that that, that would ever happen. But just, just to, you know, in the way you're presenting it, we would say that even in that verse, not everything's mistranslated normally. It could be a word mistranslated or one part mistranslated. Other parts aren't. And God can save through a word. It's a living word of God. So, yes, he, he could save. So, so even if he did not know that that verse was the right translation or not, but he heard it, and he didn't understand it clearly, but he heard it, God could have saved that person through that King James Version Bible verse, correct? It does not take uh, an individual's understanding to become saved. But even if he didn't know it was the right translation or not, you know what I'm saying? Doesn't matter. Okay, God, so just hearing God it, even just hearing it, he could have saved. Operates on the sinner. Mm -hmm. He's the one that does the saving, and he uses his word to save. And it doesn't matter what the person understands or fails to understand. That's how God can save a baby in the womb. What does a baby in the womb understand about anything? And the answer is nothing. They have, they they've never learned language. They they don't know what words mean. Mm -hmm. But God uh, has parents speak to the baby while the baby was in the womb during the day of salvation. And God is able to bless the word. They speak the word of God. They read it to the child. God's able to bless the word. The child becomes born again like John the Baptist, who had faithful parents. And, and he was saved. He leapt in the womb for joy upon hearing about Christ. And... Uh, yet John had no um, understanding of the words he was hearing. He couldn't, he couldn't understand the scriptures that were being read to him. Okay. Well, thank you for your question. Could you read uh, 1 Peter 4.15? 1 Peter 4.15. 1 Peter 4.15. 4, 15. 4, 15. 4, 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody, in other men's matters. What are, the words murderer and thief there, do you know what that's referring to? Well, uh, it had one level. It would be the natural the obvious, yeah. law. Uh, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. And there are some people that, that have, like David killed. Right. David committed adultery. Yet David suffered as a result. And he was a child of God. Right. So... Yeah, this does have some application on that level to God's people. Don't end up suffering for the breaking of the law or certainly do not uh, suffer due to erroneous doctrine that uh, could lead into another kind of a gospel and spiritually kill someone or you become like a thief, uh, you know, as God speaks of, uh, false gospels in, in, in along those lines, uh, or as an evildoer. Basically, it's saying, do not suffer for sin. Right. And in any way, in any uh, way it shows itself, do not suffer for sin uh, because, is it here that it says, what thank have ye, or is that it earlier? And... Um, 1 Peter 2, it says in verse 19, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable to God. For he even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. So that, that, that's basically it, that 
Um, you know, like sometimes things are going wrong in our life and there's troubles and afflictions and, and we tend to think, well, it's because I'm a Christian. And so, a lot of times it's, it's all, not. It's, all stupid. it's <laughs> not. It's our own sin that has brought about a situation that has caused our own discomfort or suffering. And, and, and God is basically saying, you can't escape suffering. None of us can. Not any individual in this world will escape suffering. Anyone, anyone lead a suffer-free life? Anyone here never suffer? Or We suffer, don't we? We experience troubles and turmoil in one way or another for various things. The only thing we can control by God's grace is the reason we suffer. The cause of the suffering uh, can, can be something thankworthy if we're doing it God's way and we're afflicted as a result for the word's sake, then that's a positive. And that's actually a comforting thing uh, because if, uh, like you're David, let's look at David. You're King David and you looked on the other rooftop and you end up committing adultery with Bathsheba and you slay her husband and then God sends a prophet to you to tell you you're not going to die because you are a child of God. So sin doesn't kill us, but you're going to be chastened and it's going to come to your household. And, and so the child he had with Bathsheba died, even though that was a saved child. And then in, in the history of David, we see his sons um, lusting for power, fighting one another, killing one another. His own son Absalom wants to usurp the throne and he runs from his own son. And you can be sure that in all these instances, David is thinking of what he did. And because God told him that the sword would not depart from his house because he had done that. And so it keeps coming back to him and he's suffering why? Because he's a great king. He is a great king, but that's not why he was suffering because of the evil that he did. And, and uh, so the Lord, you know, would have us uh, to, to suffer for uh, good things than evil things. Now, ha having said that, in John 8, 44, where it talks about Satan being a murderer from the beginning, it's not the same Greek word murderer as in that verse. But can that be connected in the sense that if we're sinning, it's because we're basically serving Satan? Can that connection be made? Like, I guess a little bit, but not really. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. Okay. You know, if God ever views it that way, we do serve sin. And God says, let not sin have dominion over you. And we know Satan heads up that kingdom. Right. And we're certainly... Um, we're, we're not entering into warfare with him when we're involved in those kinds of things. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's an uh, okay. area that um, I'd rather not. Okay. Mention. All right. Thank, thank you. Okay. Please explain Proverbs 11.1. 1. Proverbs 11.1. 1. A false balance is abomination to Jehovah. A just weight is his delight. And you wonder, uh, why does God get involved in weights and balances? And, and you know, even today, we still use weights and balances. When you go to the store, you buy a pound of ham, put it on a scale. Or if you go to the gas station, you buy a gallon of gas. Did you ever notice uh, at the gas station pump, inspected by a bureau of, I don't know if it's called weights and balances, standards. standards. They're still very careful that everything is according to law, according to the law of our day. If you buy a pound of ham, you should get a pound of ham. If you buy a gallon of gas, you should get a gallon of gas. Because if you get a little bit under a pound and somebody's selling you to, to you as a pound, why would they do that? They're, they're going to make out, because if they do that to every customer, 
they sell you, you know, a, a, an ounce short of a pound, and, and every customer, they're thinking, well, I'm going to save so many pounds of ham and make more money. And, and that's the way the world operates, and so there's laws against that. But when it comes to the gospel, to the word of God, God likens it to weights and balances because there has to be the, you know, the, the um, image of, um, of law. Justice. of justice is an even scale. You, you don't weigh down one side because that's not, not just. And, and so God's very concerned with that. And so a false balance is abomination to Jehovah, but a just weight is his delight. Now it says in um, Amos, there's a lot of verses, by the way, that that go along with this. I just can't remember them all. Um, in Amos chapter 8, it says in verse 4, Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small, and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes and sell the refuse of the wheat. That statement, falsifying the balances by deceit, applies to false gospels. They're not being just. They're, they're not um, laying everything out on the scale. Like, for instance, we can look at it this way. When they take one verse... And, and they give it a lot of weight. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And to them, they build their gospel around it. This, this is the central theme of their gospel. But they're not um, balancing out by comparing other scriptures that would give more information and would be a just balance. Uh, I think it, it's along those ideas. But thank you for your question. And yes, Tom. Um, we will receive wages um, according to what we do. That's, that's kind of a balance because we're going to receive uh, a wage we don't like if we do something bad. We're going to receive a wage that we will like. And we will receive it packed down and overflowing. So it's just, I think it's just a way of explaining the, the good and the, and the bad, and how he uses parables. Um, yeah, it's, as, it's as another a figure. Situation. Another figure the Lord is using. But yes, you have a question. Um, uh, I speak in parables, or I don't speak at all. Uh, so many verses talk about parables. If somebody can't see that and understand that he talks to his um, anybody in parables and that they may understand or they may not understand. So you're talking earlier about um, people not understanding the Bible is spiritual. So in a parable, it's basically spiritual. You can't understand it unless he lets you understand. He says, I wrote the Bible to look like foolishness to the wise of the world. Because the Bible I wrote, I'm spiritual and you're not of spiritual. So again, if someone that's in the Bible talking about what you were saying earlier, that you just can't read it literally. It's, I mean, it's, it's just impossible. That's the wise of the world. If he don't open your eyes spiritually, you're not going to see anything. Yeah. So it's all the par parables of, uh, of the Bible that he will open, his, uh, open your eyes to so you will see this. And the people that teach anything different than that, they're, they're just losing all these verses and putting them aside, the parable verses. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's true. It's uh, accurate um, that God has to open up our eyes in order for us to see and understand the spiritual meaning of things. And when he does, then we realize that uh, you have to, it's not an option, you have to look for the deeper spiritual meaning. Like, for instance, in Galatians, um, in Galatians 4, God is going to tell us about things we would read in the book of Genesis. And sometimes you'll, you'll have uh, 
a pastor say, well, yes, there are parables in the Bible, Christ spoke in parables, and they would say Proverbs is a book of parables, and, and certain other places like in Ezekiel and Revelation. But, but for the most part, they say when you come to history, when you come to the Bible's history, you can't ever interpret that as a, Bible, uh, as a parable. And yet here's what God says in Galatians 4 in verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who is of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Sounds like a Mr. Camping study, doesn't it? It sounds like Mr. Camping going in depth to some scripture. And, and you know what they say about uh, Mr. Camping? He spiritualizes. He spiritualizes. Well, of course he spiritualizes. Doesn't God spiritualize? If you go back to Genesis and you read about Sarah and Hagar and Abraham, and Isaac, and Ishmael. Does it say it's an allegory anywhere? Does it say, does it present uh, any part of that biblical history as though it should be understood parabolically? No, you're reading biblical history, and God is interpreting biblical history to us, and he's saying, which things are an allegory? And then, Hey, uh, you know, uh, this, this is something that seems far-fetched that God would say, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. <laughs> That's who Hagar is. And Sarah corresponds to Jerusalem above. Does that sound outlandish? If, if you were listening to someone teach in Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Daniel, and they would say, this Hagar represents... Sinai in Arabia. And, and you would think, well, oh, where did they get that from? Well, God, the perfect teacher who gave us the word, just interpreted a few chapters of the book of Genesis for us. And he told us, now when you get to Genesis, um, wherever this takes place, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, to the birth of Isaac in chapter 21, 22. And you see the relationship between Abraham and the bondmaid Hagar and his wife Sarah and the children that are born. When you see all that, here's the spiritual meaning of five chapters or six chapters or several chapters in the book of Genesis. And now what else they say, the pastors and the theologians say, is, well, grudgingly, yes, Wherever the Bible interprets itself, we'll understand that is spiritual. You can do that grudgingly, they allow. Well, you see how just foolish it is to go back to Genesis, and you're in chapter 12, and, well, there's no statement in the New Testament, so I have to read this historically. I'm not allowed to look for a spiritual meaning. But when I get to chapter 15... Then I'm going to dig in. And when I get to chapter 16, but when I get to chapter 23 and there's no direct explanation in the New Testament, back to the historical grammatical method of interpretation. It's inconsistent. It's, it will lead you astray. There is no basis for that kind of understanding. Really, Christ who spoke in parables... And without a parable, he did not speak, was teaching us how to understand the whole Bible. And here in Galatians and in some other places, God helps us. And he says, remember Christ spoke in parables? Well, that's exactly how you have to read Genesis, as though it were a parable. Or look at 1 Corinthians in chapter 9. And um, I love how God says this. 
in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, in verse 8, Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses. So it's written in the law. It's not written in Proverbs. It's not written in a section that you would expect to find a parable. It's in the law. Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Does God take care for oxen? This is eternal God of the heavens. Is he really concerned about the ox? What is he concerned with? His people. His people. His gospel message. And, and then in verse 10, Or saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. So you get the literal image or, or command, don't muzzle the ox treading out the corn. And it has to do with the, um, the sharing of the gospel, that you should not hinder someone involved in the sharing of the gospel. But again, does God take care for oxen? There's a lot of laws in the Bible where God speaks of not mingling seed together. Does he take care about whether you throw two different kinds of seed in your field? There's so many laws, sacrifices, and, and all kinds of laws are given. And the, it goes back to this. For our sakes. For our sakes. You can read the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 10. And where there God speaks of the historical account found in the book of Exodus of Israel passing through the Red Sea. True history, true Bible history. And verse 2, and we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Spiritual, 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 meat and drink and Christ. And again, you go back to the book of Exodus. It's just a plain cross. I mean, a miraculous crossing, but it's a plain crossing through the sea and then out the other side. And no mention of being baptized or drinking spiritual drink or eating spiritual food and we, we see through many statements like this how God wrote the Bible, how the Bible must be understood when the disciples forgot to take bread or bring bread. What did Jesus say? I forget. <laughs> yeah, beware. Thank you. Beware. That, that's not good when you say uh, when the disciples forgot and then the next thing you say is I forgot. Well, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and they, they wondered amongst themselves, is it because we, ha we, we have no bread? I better read this. Anybody know where it is? It's in Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Uh, Matthew 16. I'll start verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reason among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand? Neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets she took up, neither the seven loaves of the 4,000, and how many baskets she took up. How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread? They should beware the living of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware the living of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So bread equals doctrine. Bread equals doctrine. Well, uh, there Jesus is, he didn't open up by saying um, the kingdom of heaven is like to speak a parable. It's normal, everyday activity between him and his disciples. And yet he's still teaching in parables, still speaking in parables. 
But yes. Can you read uh, Zechariah 8, 1 to 6? Zechariah 8. And I was just wondering, is that in our time spiritually right now, or is that in... You mean this passage? Yes. Okay. Uh, Zechariah 8, verse 1. Again, the word of Jehovah of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith Jehovah, and returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of Jehovah of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, if it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, saith Jehovah of hosts. So the question is, is that happening now? Is yeah. this happening now? Is that going to be in the new heaven and new earth? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, we do know God is dwelling in Zion at this time because he saved all the elect and therefore he's indwelling the whole body of believers and, and he makes that kind of statement that he's dwelling in Zion but this says I am returned unto Zion and will it, it's also true of the new heaven and new earth that God will dwell there with his people so I'm not sure I'm sorry okay thank you you're welcome thank you and this will be our last question uh, Isaiah sixty six twenty two to twenty four. Isaiah sixty six twenty two. Just explain the timing of that. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, sh and notice that statement, which I will make. No doubt about it. God will, future tense, make a new heaven and new earth. Um shall remain before me, saith Jehovah, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith Jehovah. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. And the question is... Explain the timing of that. Well, th this is um, looking at the new heaven and new earth, and at that point, we know that the sinner is dead forever. He's annihilated. He no longer exists. But here, it's as though God is saying that the elect would go forth and look upon the carcasses of them that transgressed and, and their worm would not die and their fire quenched. And it's been this kind of verse that has fueled the idea of an eternal hell. The, the way God wrote this verse, uh, together with other scriptures, presents the idea there is the unsaved dead and... Um, their worm shall not die, and the fire is not quenched. So they're burning forever and ever and ever. But really, it's language indicating they are dead forever, and it's a shameful thing. The worm identifies with shame and death, and it, it's an eternal destruction from the Lord. When the Bible declares that the wages of sin is death, death is forever and forever the dead will be um, uh, w really will be a shame that they did die created in the image and likeness of God to live forever and yet they die the death of a beast and they cease to exist and this wording is uh, each each um, element of it can be explained if we had more time but it's pointing to the eternal death of the wicked it's not teaching hell. Where it says that they shall go forth, it's talking about the elect, right? And look upon the carcasses. Yeah, that, that's so, what it appears to be. So it's not possible that in the new heaven and the new earth that 
that would take place. No. It's, it's, it's well, spiritual well, well, language. It, it's, it's not. Um, first of all, the, the carcasses don't even exist. Right. The, there are no carcasses of the dead. There is no worm that will not die. So it's totally... There is no actual fire that right. is forever burning. And so there are no elect actually going to look. Right. The former things are not remembered. So right. it wouldn't you know, so mesh none of with it, that. It, it's just uh, God is teaching something with a sort of a vivid image yeah. uh, of a picture it's, of, all right, go look upon them, if you could, which we will not be able to do, and you will see that they are dead forever. And, it's almost like and a, there, is, there is that element that the elect will be in eternity future living, they will not be there. And their absence is a testimony to their death. So in that sense, we are looking upon their carcass, because they're not in the new heaven and new earth. It's almost like a third spiritual level of uh, that, that verse. It's very, very difficult to understand. It's difficult. Understand. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, why don't we stop here and close with a word of prayer. After praying. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for all your blessings to us, and we thank you for your word. We pray that you would... Uh, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and that you would uh, help us as we read the Bible to uh, find the uh, deeper meaning, the meaning that gives glory to you. And we know that uh, you have written the Bible in this way. It, it's actually one of the proofs that the Bible is from you. Only this book is written like this. You cannot dig into other books written by men and look for deeper spiritual truth. You cannot find consistency and harmony. And uh, it, it, it just does not happen. But in this book, your word, we find uh, consistency throughout, perfect harmony, perfect cohesiveness, perfect um, spiritual truth kept from beginning to end. And Father, we, we thank you when we are able to see a spiritual truth, whether in one verse or a whole passage or a whole book. We thank you uh, because it is a blessing to us that you have granted us uh, this understanding. And we do pray that we would continue to search the scriptures. And we also know when we find truth, we're finding a peace uh, or a bit of the Lord Jesus and as you are truth and Father we uh, we pray for each one here may we spend more time in the Bible more time in reading and studying and searching and we pray that you would uh, help us in this uh, we pray that you would be with each one that is traveling going back home and uh, all of your people today help us uh, to remember today is your holy day. It's Sunday the Sabbath. Help us to uh, involve ourselves in spiritual activities such as reading the Bible and praying and or handing out tracts. And Father, we pray uh, once again for your blessing upon us that we don't deserve it for nothing we have done or ever could do but only for Christ's sake. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And thanks for joining us again for eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your speaker, Chris McCann. You can join us for these Questions and Answers sessions Sunday afternoon following Sunday studies and Monday and Friday evenings following the Monday and Friday evening studies. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.